think all of us, even those of us who may now be in various professions, or many of us, I know I do, have working class backgrounds, and sometimes I think we feel most comfortable when we get together with people from neighborhoods who have those backgrounds. Because the fundamental struggle of working women, neighborhood women, women who are involved in the business of participating in society in every way, in the home as well as in the factory, in the fields, in professions, in offices, a women essentially on whom this country has been based and built. Many of us have created the generations which have peopled this nation. And what I think most people don't understand, and what your statement is being made in a very eloquent way to the public to understand, is that a woman's movement is a movement of all women. And fundamental to the movement of women is the participation of all of us as we come out of our neighborhoods, as we come out of our backgrounds, to come together to exchange our ideas and to discuss our problems. The women whom the Congress of Neighborhood Women represent know that the women's movement is something real. It's not some intellectual, upper middle class thing that people try to make it. It's our problems. It's ours. It's us. It's our today. And more than today, it's our tomorrow. We come together for today because we have to build a tomorrow for ourselves, for our neighborhoods, and for our kids and their neighborhoods and their hopes and their future in the neighborhood, in the city, in the state, and in the country. Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show. We're broadcasting live from downtown Brooklyn, USA. Special Saturday program. I am just back from Sao Paulo. Greetings, super producer Matt Leck. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Matt greeted me more nicely off air. Greetings, Chief Economist David Griscom. How's it going? Going well on this week's program, the great crystal ball. She's here. She's going to be in studio with us shortly, and we're talking about wandering dolazol everybody wandering dolazol a joke that was incredibly funny that i put away because even though i always criticized warren on the merits i still actually gave some deference to the endless neurotic whiny calls for unity but no more will that get in the way of good and accurate comedy we're talking about the warren gambit the sleazy move against Sanders, how it helps Biden, but might keep the fuel going for Sanders. What are the possible back channels between Warren and Biden as well? And how a innocent statement from Bernie Sanders, which basically he could have plagiarized from Barack Obama, is the new drama and nonsense of Twitter. Then, of course, we have a gem with David Griscom. We've got the peak of the synergy of all cable news because a body language expert is on with Joy Reid to, of course, smear Bernie Sanders. I, I Look, if you're an oligarch, obviously you hate Bernie Sanders. And if you're a, you know, a normal voter and it's not your politics one way or another, okay, we'll hopefully persuade you. But if you really don't like Bernie Sanders, I'm tempted to say you have a character defect. We'll also be talking about some of my trip to Brazil and an event that happened while I was in Brazil, which was namely Brazil's former culture minister doing a speech under a Wagner soundtrack where he quoted Goebbels. All that and much, much more on a special Saturday episode of TMBS. I'm sorry, I'm checking my phone for a second because uh, Crystal Ball of the Hill is en route. But first, let me start by talking about some lessons that I think that I got from traveling to Brazil and interviewing President Lula this week. And let's put this picture up. Um, the first half of the interview will be released on Wednesday. We had a wide ranging conversation in conjunction with our partners at Brazil Wire, Brian Mayer and Daniel Hunt. We talked about Iran, we talked about Uber, 
the future of labor organizing, U.S. espionage in Brazil, and a real, I would say, love-centered, justice-based policy for the people. This is me presenting President Lula with his uh, TMBS Lula Livre t-shirt. Um, and I want to say that obviously it was an immense honor. It meant a huge amount for me personally, and it could not have happened without this incredible community. Um, everybody, who, obviously, who works on this show, all of the patrons and members of the show, but also everybody, of course, who watches on YouTube and, and, and listens on podcast and everybody who participated in this. I want to really thank all of you and say that this is going to be something that uh, is an indication of our future. More work like this, more projects like this. And I really do believe that without uh, romanticizing which is a, you know, of course, that's not the direction we can go in, but there is an enormous amount to learn from the strategy, from the emotional intelligence, and really from the, I'll say it again, unflinchingly, the love that actually drives um, some of the politics here. And that came across very strongly in the conversation with President Lula. We need to build an international left. And we hit on this a lot because the struggles that we all face are obviously differentiated, complex, but they're synchronized. I was in a favela yesterday in Sao Paulo, hanging out at a community radio station and listening to the terror that the Bolsonaro regime has unleashed on the underclass of Brazil. And they were asking me about Donald Trump, and again, the, the parallels that we all see intellectually are felt viscerally when you're talking about people on the primary receiving end, the people in the peripheries, right? And also people in the upper echelons as well, getting catered to and directed to um, by these this, this authoritarian capitalist politics we're in. The major issues that we face, climate change, financialization, the multiple crises of capitalism and the authoritarianism that comes along with it are going country by country, election by election. Undoing the devastation of neoliberalism and eradicating its networks and its institutions will require an international movement and a global sensibility. That's why, of course, we support Bernie Sanders. This is yet another trip that I've had where People in the global South who have a left perspective are saying, please elect Bernie Sanders president, please. This is the only person who has any type of sensibility, any type of remote understanding of what we face, particularly those on the receiving ends of US hegemony, foreign policy and interference. Look at the destabilization of Latin America in just even the last four years. Has any candidate come forward as loudly or at all as Bernie Sanders did to call for the freeing of Lula when he was a political prisoner against the coup in Bolivia, against U.S. efforts at a coup in Venezuela, which, yes, he could have been sharper on, but he still did say the right thing on. Especially when most other Dem Democratic candidates sound like Republicans when it comes to U.S. adventurism. Trump was promoting Modi, uh, who, of course, was normalized in the international system by Barack Obama. Bernie Sanders clearly and unequivocally stood up for Kashmir. Bernie Sanders voted against Donald Trump's military budgets. Bernie Sanders voted against sanctions in Iran. And just this last week, Bernie opposed the absolutely devastating new NAFTA deal on the very sensible grounds that it does not mention the climate crisis once the technocratic worldview of Macron's won't save us. The far right will push us to oblivion. Only a committed, transformative, and truly international democratic socialist project can deal with the challenges we face. And we say this constantly on the show because it's true. It's the urgent message of our time. It's the only way we can synchronize restoring necessary national sovereignties in the face of global capital so that people can regulate their environment vent their environmental concerns promote public health uh, at the expense of global predatory capital and then at the same time fight 
for the rights of migrants and refugees, dismantle the criminalization of people moving uh, across the globe, most often as a result of either the climate crisis, U.S. adventurism, uh, or other forms of economic devastation. We need this form of internationalization. And the message that I got back from Brazil is that we've got a lot of partners that are ready for that. And we have leaders and leadership and a guy like President Lula that came so clear through this interview, the caring for the poor, the visceral sense of justice, that has to be the driver of it. And we have to model that. We have to emulate that. And we have to take that sense of moral purpose and commitment to what is still often nerdy, pathetic, sad, wonky, professional, crappy, bleak, passive aggressive shit US Democratic Party politics. That needs to be washed out with an actual energy of solidarity, commitment, loyalty, and a ruthless commitment to an actual new agenda. Do you guys have anything you want to add to that? You know, we talk a lot about how this Bernie Sanders moment, when he comes into power, he's going to be relying on us to make sure that these changes happen in our country. We should also be making the second point, which is that no one nation, no one country is going to be able to make these changes alone. If we don't have this kind of international movement that's uniting um, the left across the, the globe, but also just countries in general, we're not going to be able to tackle climate change and we're not going to be able to tackle you know, international capital, which is a massive, uh, you know, a massive uh, struggle that we need to face. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is by uh, coming together and building an international left. That's absolutely right. And again, I think it's also when we talk about that you need some Machiavelli, you need some spirituality, hey – that synthesis is what they have there, right? That's what you get at PT headquarters in Brazil. That's what you get when you have those conversations um, and those meetings. Crystal Ball has entered the building. How are you doing? Good to see you. Welcome Good to back. See you. Thank you. <laughs> How's the trip? It was a great trip. I was just talking about it. Um, I, I mean, I'm still super jet lagged. All right. Yeah. I got back at like... It's only like, what, three hours difference? Um, yeah, no, it's a short difference. I just hate flying. That's like, I love traveling and really, really hate flying. Should I put these on? Um, yeah, you could put them on because we're about to do the shout out, right? Oh, yeah. All right, we're going to do a shout out segment. Crystal, are you ready for that? Uh, I, I think so. I think you're ready. <laughs> Crystal requested that she be here for a shout out. <laughs> um, so we'll do that. And then... Uh, Quick pitch, and then we're going to talk about Wandering Dull is All. <laughs> shout out, shout out. Did you, wait, play the Alex Jones one, would you? Oh, okay. I missed the Alex Jones one. It's a nice setup you guys have. It's nice, yeah? Yeah. Welcome. Let's get to uh, the shout out. Shout out, shout out. Creepy. Shout out, shout out, shout out. Weird. I think that's creepy. I just feel it, totally it, comfortable with this. Again. Shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. This is crazy. Shout out, shout out, shout out. We're big Alex Jones This is out of control. Shout out, shout out. That's creepy. Shout out, shout out. hometown hero here. Hometown hero of Austin. Crazy. Shout out, shout out. This is crazy. I used to see him on public TV actually all the time growing up. It sort of scarred me. There was one of the funny, I don't, I, we have to dig it up. He can't, he went on, um, he was outside live streaming in some bar. And what I loved was that, <laughs> and this was like the proof that, you know, I don't think Alex Jones super re respects his audience. So he's sitting <laughs> there. Yeah, like yeah, I'm just being <laughs> diplomatic. And he's there and he's just like, you know, we're here because, you know, we got to, we got to protect our children. And then, uh, <laughs> That's good. and then this guy comes up to him and the guy you know the guy has a look of I, I watched once upon a time in Hollywood on the plane so I have this on the brain the look of somebody who would be in the Manson family and he walks up to Alex Jones and he's just like hey Alex I got you know we've got we've got a streaming site which you know NSA can't track or you know some something like that and Alex Jones like it's awesome because he does his version of the universal, like, ah, it's great, brother, you know, email netscape.org, Alex, you know, whatever, get, right, get out. Right, And the guy orders, do we, oh my God, you're a genius, Matt. 
Do we actually have this? Uh, he t he caught wait, wait, a Q-tip. It's, it's, it's up. Uh, oh, yeah, this is it. Complacency All right, let's play this for a second. Hey, 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 Milo. Good man. Big listen. God bless you. <laughs> By the way, I just want to let you know, um, I own InfoWarsMusic.com. That's you. awesome. That's Do you see us awesome. online? Just come in there. I saw you on Facebook Live. Yeah, I'm, I'm the Spider-Man guy on Sixth Street. Oh, great job, brother. Have you heard about me? I have. <laughs> yeah, I went into the. Uh, I went into the. Uh, Look at that beer. He's ready to <laughs> sit down. I went to the Muslim thing, the taxpayer funding of the schools, and I went there with my costume and my trunk shirt in the cafe. <laughs> On We're all laughing. I saw it viral. I'm gonna scram, but I'm gonna get your drink. Boom! Thanks. I gotta go right now. I, I want to set up InfoWarsMusic.com. That's why I moved to Austin, Texas. Can you help me do it? Whoa! Whoa. R O B D. O B D. And InfoWars.com. Say it again. R O B D and InfoWars. I ran to some lady. She's oh, like, right. I met your InfoWars right. guy. All right, all right, all right. We'll get back to the show. But anyway, <laughs> I, I just love the, how big that beer is. Right. He's ready. <laughs> he's ready for the long haul with that one. It's like, he's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm not going. I just ordered like a, a fucking German championship size. Like, no, we're friends. And we're going to be even better friends by the end of the night. David, what's the shout out that we have? And then we will do a short pitch and get yeah. to it. Um, this is just something that's been going on this week. It's, uh, it's been very massive and exciting, inspiring. It's, been, uh, it's called Moms for Housing. And in Oakland, where there's a horrible crisis when it comes to affordable housing uh, for... Uh, women who've been living in shelters actually have moved their families into a massive house in Oakland that has been empty for something around three years. It's owned by a corporation called Wedgwood Holding Company. And they've basically said, hey, you know, we have a housing crisis. Mm -hmm. There's empty houses. Let's house people. So they um, right. they moved their family in there. And unfortunately, this week, uh, the police ended up evicting them, showing up at five in the morning oh. with a SWAT team, Shh, with a SWAT uh, team. tank, a tank, actually. Oh, my God. And um, but they're they're fearless. This I, is see, after... I just have to say, I mean, this is what I mean. It sounds yeah. melodramatic when you say that there are parallels between the favela I'm in yesterday and what's oh, happening yeah. in the United States. This is a direct analogy. I think you're absolutely right. And, yeah. uh, you know, this is a, a short clip of them speaking after the fact. And it's just something I wanted to shout out because one, it was very brave of them to make this movement in the first place. And two, they're continuing to fight and bring awareness to this crucial issue. Realizing over 300 people in 15 minutes. That's right. That's what we did because we all care and we all have humanity and we want to change this system that has four to 6,000 people sleeping on the streets right now. And if you're not angry, you should get angry that our tax dollars went to this extreme force to evict mothers and children at five o'clock in the morning. We are saying no, we are here. We're standing with Misty and Talani and Jesse. They took them in handcuffs. We're coming to get you. We're coming to get you. You have thoughts, Crystal? I do. Um, you know, that word humanity, it's easy to sort of throw it around. But the reality is it doesn't matter what city you're in these days. You cannot walk down a street without stepping over a body of a human being who is living there, unsheltered, exposed to elements, you know, sometimes with mental health issues that go untreated, but often just a mother who yeah. can't make it, mm -hmm. right? And it's not only damaging to that person's humanity to live in those conditions, which are, you know, abhorrent, and how can we turn the other way? But it's ass of all of us to, to undermine our own humanity, to live, to, to allow those conditions to persist. Something that I've been thinking about a lot because, I mean, you know, I live in D.C., you guys are here, I spent time in San Francisco, no matter where you go, because housing costs have gotten so incredibly out of control, even at the same time that, you know, supposedly the economy is great, supposedly unemployment's low, et cetera, et cetera. But we are not a society when we look at one another and don't even see another human being. So when she raises that word of humanity, it is so important. I think like if I had to say sort of the bedrock principle of my politics, it is just like the baseline of humanity that exists in every human being. I mean, it's really that simple right. that we don't exclude anyone from that, that we don't say some people are worthy of having that humanity and dignity recognized and other people aren't. So um, that's unbelievable. The courage it takes 
to step out and do what those women are doing and the price they're paying. And the price that we have a sense of the price they're paying. We have this up. We just put it up. Okay, we play that in B roll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, and again, that really is like there'll be a lot more when that interview comes out. But that I started to understand. I mean. I focus on the international. I think Brazil matters. I think all of this stuff. But why do I like this guy Lula so much? Why do I think it matters so much? It's because that's his whole message as a president is that I have never seen, I think obviously Bernie Sanders does. This guy, I asked him about the Uber economy and he's sitting there both as a president and this and that, but also as certainly as somebody who has his own, you know, facing his own persecutions and he is like the idea of some like even he it just had this image of like he's like a guy de delivering pizza in the rain who wasn't warm enough disturbs him he's like that can't be and it can't be why is it when i'm president that the rich can come in without a security check and the poor can't talk to their president that's wrong and i think that yeah, that very basic humanity. And so many people want to obscure it for so many different reasons. So I, I love that you put it that way. Let me make a really brief pitch. We'll do a more full one on Tuesday. Um, guys, we've had another great month on Patreon. We're about to hit, we're at 3,290 something. So let's, let's get to 3,300 by the end of the evening. Let's get to more. Um, that's what allows things like the you know, trip to Brazil and all the other stuff that we're doing. Um, we're almost sold out for February 7th at the Bell House, so snag your tickets. People who've ordered hoodies, like the one I gave Lula. <laughs> uh, <laughs> did you see that picture? I did, it was awesome. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't interrupt the interview, but his uh, girlfriend threw it on on the side, and it was so, it was horrible. It was like every piece of self-promotion I had wanted to just be like, yeah, could you, <laughs> Time out. Can we get a picture? We need to get, I need to get this yeah, up on yeah, my Instagram. Yeah. Can we get? Can we gram this now? Uh, we're gonna mail those out within a matter of a week or two, I think. Um, we put in the first order. Um, so if you ordered them already online, they're gonna be in the mail fairly soon. We've got you. And then when you come to these live shows, the Bell House, we're announcing our next live show on Tuesday, which is gonna be in April. Um, we're gonna be selling those there as well patreon.com slash tmbs um there's some other stuff but honestly i forget and we'll just keep going well I, if i Crystal can Ball. add to the pitch, I, to the I, pitch. Can, I can personally Please. assure you that the michael brooks live show is a good time yes so much fun thank the, you for letting me do that with you thank you it was so much fun thank you that was a great show mm -hmm. and we are going to be on stage again soon That's correct right. indeed crystal Coming Go to New York. It. Oh, God. Now I don't remember the date. What date is it? It's March. I don't remember the date either. 7th. Anyway, go to rising.substack.com. And there's a and book. You can get all the details and details about the book, Populist Guide to 2020. That's written with my co host, Sagar and Jetty. Um, yeah, we're coming to New York. Michael's going to be there. Kyle Kalinsky's going to be there as well. It's like an epic crossover it's gonna episode. Be a, it's going to be a banger. It's going to be amazing in LA. Uh, Jimmy Dore is going to be there with us. So. <laughs> It's, it's going to be a wild time there, too. Awesome. Yep. Um, all right. So, Crystal, I was in Sao Paulo. I'm interviewing a guy. This week is this uh, month is intense. Next week, Cornell West, right? Lula and Cornell West. These are two big deals to me. And I'm also in Brazil. So yeah. I'm not really, like, super up on my phone. And then I see... Before I leave, I see apparently there's some sort of canvassing talking point. We don't know whether or not it's even real. And if it is real, fine. Right. If it <laughs> isn't real, it's it. nothing. It's, right. it's just a truism. Uh, then, you know, a couple of different steps. All of a sudden, actually, can we sh throw up that Sopranos meme before I throw to Crystal? Have you seen the Sopranos meme? I don't know. I want to show you this because this is my interpretation of what happens. Although the difference is, is I want to give Polly Walnuts credit here because Polly Walnuts actually, at least it was in real time. All right, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, all right. Well, it's in the show outline, so we'll get to it in a second. 
what the fuck <laughs> just happened? <laughs> You know exactly what just happened. I mean, it's disgusting, and it's, you've been covering it perfectly. It's a, I mean, it's just a blatant political ploy. Throw your friend under the bus for your own gain. That's all it is. It's plain and simple. And you know what's so ironic? I love that. I'm glad that you started with the beginning of the week and Elizabeth Warren's feigned outrage. How could you, Bernie, right? How could you have a volunteer script that accurately points out that wh who is in my coalition, right? And then the very next day, or you leak this this thing to CNN that supposedly Bernie Sanders is this massive sexist and told you a woman could never be president. I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? And we all can see it's coming down to the wire. Only you know two weeks basically now till Iowa. She's got all these like ex Clinton apparatchiks that she staffed her team with. And they told her, look, polls aren't looking good. You got to make something happen. And there's this fork in the road, right? She can either go after Joe Biden, who is the front runner, who has a long track record of doing actual harm to women, who in a past life, Elizabeth Warren excoriated for his record said you can't claim to be a champion of women in the morning and, and sell them out in the evening. So I'm paraphrasing, but that was basically the, what she had to say and had this great, this great analysis of how, you know, supporting women isn't just about like a few token issues. It's about supporting every aspect of their lives and their humanity and their dignity, as we were just saying. And if you aren't a part of that, if you'd rather serve your corporate masters and the credit card issuers that come from your state, then you are no ally of women. That is literally the message that brought Elizabeth Warren into politics, literally in opposition to Joe Biden. So here she is, right, coming down to it. You're on one of the biggest stages imaginable. And you can either launch that righteous attack on Joe Biden, who very much could be the nominee, or you could launch this you know, pack of lies scurrilous, nasty, personal attack on your supposed friend who you've been buddy buddy with all year and telling us all that we can't, you know, we can't divide. We can't possibly make any critique or, or discuss the differences between the two of them. Definitely don't talk about her voting record. No, That's can't do that. Horrible. Can't do that. It's totally evil. But you so she has this choice and she decides to go after her friend and do incredible damage to the progressive movement. And the real, look, I think everyone saw through it. Everyone that, you know, was, is at all persuadable saw through it. It just looks like the complete political ploy and personal betrayal that it was. But there's an opportunity cost because as you know, the Sanders team was all, they were ramping up to make a major critique of Joe Biden. We were all talking about the Iraq war vote in particular. John Kerry had to get trotted out to defend him on this thing. He still doesn't have any good answer on it. John Kerry is like, yeah, the, <laughs> your, your effective Iraq oh, answer right. from 2004. Right. <laughs> exactly. Let's go. So this is all queued up. And rather than having a news cycle that's about issues of war and peace and the judgment of a potential commander in chief, we have to talk about what was said in a private conversation between two friends over a year ago. How does that affect any voter's life, by the way? Look, right. Bernie didn't say what she said. Like, it's of course that, not. obviously not. Yes. But let's say he did. Honestly, so what? how many people, how many feminists after Hillary Clinton lost, talked about the sexism she faced and how that was a contributor to her loss. The natural conclusion from that analysis is it's harder for a woman to win. That is the natural conclusion. And so the other part of this as a woman that I find, as someone who- Look at this piece, the who, match is pulled up. Right. Emily's from, list from was- Emily's uh, list. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm right. sorry, keep going. I just yeah, want to so underline what you're saying. The other thing, like as a woman who, by the way, ran for office and saw a little bit of sexism out there on the trail. A little bit. Now basically you've, you've made it so we can't even have that discussion, honestly. Like we can't be open about the realities of, of running as a woman. I, it's just like so wrong and nasty on every level. It's completely exposed. Like I saw my, my old colleague, Joy Ann Reed, this morning brought in. Did you guys <laughs> well, see we're this? We're gonna get to that in a second. Okay, all right, I'll put, Let's up, put, I'll put, put the, uh, put up the Sopranos meme, please. The only thing I wanna say as I walk through this is that to Pauline Walnut's credit, at least this is in real time and not 14 months later, <laughs> but this is the great Pine Barrens episode. 
Yes. This is uh, Warren as Polly Walnuts. Hey, Bernie, I just want to let you know I'm going to run for president. And then Bernie, like, congrats. That's great. Be careful because Trump is a racist, sexist liar who will weaponize whatever he can against you. Polly Wallace to Christopher. You hear that shit? He said a woman could never be president. <laughs> <laughs> and that summarizes everything. But I think, except again, at least Pauly just got off of the phone with a bad cell connection. And it was really cold. Parents. And it was really cold and his blood sugar was bad and he wasn't supposed to kill the Russian guy, but maybe the Russian isn't even dead. But the thing is, is that, I mean, here, here's what I want to touch on about this though, that really... There's so many things about this that drive me crazy. I mean, one you pointed out is just that it's disgusting on a personal level. And that's sort of like it, you know, it sucks. It's disgusting. But like, OK, it's politics, I guess. And then the next one is it. I'm not convinced. I think she does have a back channel to Joe Biden, if I had to guess. And I certainly am not somebody who, well, I've said for a long time, and I used to get a lot of pushback because I would say I'm not, every time people would spin these like fantasy scenarios about them like running together, but against each other or whatever people were cooking up in their heads, I was like, I'm not convinced that, look, I think if it goes to a broker convention, there's deal making and horse trading. And it could go either way. I'm not at all convinced that she would just go to Bernie. I never was. Why Why what? would you think that? I mean, I she don't had know. a chance a to help Bernie last time, and she didn't do it. Well, she I mean, waited around, and then, you know, when it was safe, decided to back the person that she thought could make her Treasury Secretary or whatever. Like, that right. to me was the beginning of – that is when she decided – I'm going to be an establishment player. But right. that's like the best, most charitable interpretation is that she convinced herself that's the way to have the most influence and impact. But it's the road to hell because ultimately you just keep selling off these pieces of your soul. You can de justify just about anything if you think, well, if that will just put me in a position of power, I will be in the position to make these changes and help women and families the way that I know that I can. I mean, I think that's the way the Clintons think about a lot of this I stuff I think that's too. true, but I, I guess, yeah, I think that's all 100% right. And then the other things, it's like, okay, the rhetoric, the discourse around her was so policed Oh, that yeah. like I couldn't even like literally I mean because it's just not even worth the battle. But I used to do you know I was I did a bit last year at a live show where it's like you know what my fantasy of course is that Bernie will do Trump style rallies because that would be hilarious. Right. And he comes out and he's like you know wandering dollars all everybody, <laughs> you know she could have endorsed me but she didn't because she's wandering doll. But she says she's Native American, but she's not, and she had a Cherokee recipe. But it's a lie, you know, like I would pow love to see it. Yeah, yeah pow wow chow. So, and I was willing to, I, and what was funny to me was that like, I, I do think there was some segment of people that probably hated her irrationally. And then there was another group of people that I actually, even though they still whined about it constantly, I acquiesced to. I was like, okay, let's take a whole bunch of stuff off of the table. Let's not even talk about things that frankly, like just objectively, regardless of what I personally think about it, are going to be a problem in a general election. Yeah. Like you can, you can like, you know, uptight and, you know, like sort of, you know, tone police everybody in a primary to not talk about her saying she was Native American for decades. And then in a general election, it's going to be a massive fat target. So that was one thing. And then it overlapped with this really concerning thing about progressive politics to me, which is just like people living in a fantasy life, which is like... Ironically, like I don't I, I think it's sleazy what she did a hundred percent, but I think for the past over a year, they both should have been respectfully saying Here's this is why I think that we <laughs> because we're running against each other. Right. So people have this like it's going to be like some movie and at the end of the Olympics, one of them is going to be hurt and then they're going to put the arms around each other and walk. It's like they're running against each other. So if there was this other fantasy world, then Bernie wouldn't be running or she wouldn't be running. They're in conflict. And I guess I'm I mean, one, it's that obviously all of that all of that game playing was always to the benefit of Warren. But I think it also reveals a mindset that is still really fundamentally unserious about acquiring power. And that disturbs me. Yes. Like, of course, she's going to try to win. Of course, she's going to try to win. And you're right. I mean, this was ultimately because it was so ugly and obviously a political ploy. I think it um, I think it backfired. I don't think this is going to serve her. I don't think it's going to hurt Bernie other than the opportunity cost of not having the focus on Biden, which is real and which is important. 
but yeah, um, she and her team, and Pete, we should say too, like these are people that are playing to win and right. they will use the tactics that are necessary. It was always obvious to me from the beginning that the um, progressives who are making the unity argument of like, let's have a detente, let's not critique each other, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they wanted to spin this narrative where Bernie and Warren are just the same, right. except she's a woman and she's younger. So obviously we should go with her. <laughs> right. right? Exactly. I mean, that was the thing. Right. It was always but, the subtext. But yeah. it was only applied in one direction. Right. On the other hand, you were allowed to go on MSNBC and be like, well, you don't have to be a sexist to for Bernie. And he's a, you know, angry and divisive and, and grouchy old man and all those things. I like the grouchy old man part personally. But right. um like his response to Tom Steyer. <laughs> what he was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, like, okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> Just total cold too. shoulder. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Um, but it was always obvious to me that that whole framing was meant to benefit Warren because it's true. If you just put them up, if you say, oh, they're exactly the same, except she's a woman and she's younger, yeah, you probably go with her. All right. But if you're allowed to talk about the very real differences and I had the same right part of I think why I have such an emotional response to this thing and had such a hard time getting over it is because of the amount of blowback that I would get yep. from talking about like okay where is she really on Medicare for all and what does this look like and you know is she what is her theory of change and what how does she view movement politics because she's adopting some of the rhetoric but she hasn't been there for the fights like those are real things they're not meant to be personal they're not to be meant to be ugly they just are the reality we talked a lot about their different coalitions the same as the volunteer right. call script that got them so upset and the amount of blowback that i got for that versus now the people are like going to the mat over the right of elizabeth warren to smear her longtime friend and great ally of women as sexist is just you know it's completely outrageous and hypocritical yeah and i think it also reveals another problem which is and I want to be really, you know, I think this is something I always try to articulate on this show that like, I'm not for a second going to confuse the really serious commitment to equity, civil rights, and all of these areas on like actual substantive policy grounds and as public values with like, just the toxicity and stupidity of like Twitter games and woke performance art, and all of this other stuff, which is repulsive to every category of normal person. Yes. And I'll be really clear, by normal, I mean, I know transgender people who are not obsessed with politics. I know working class Jewish people. Like I'm saying if you're not sitting on Twitter and you don't think like, you know, oh my God, like did you see this new like Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren dragon meme, then you're probably a normal person. And I think you find like the moralism, the control freakery, the confusion of manners with substance. Right. And also, frankly, this, which is like most human beings perceive it as like, wow, that's some really dirty shit to do to somebody who's bent over backwards for you. And only in a world where you're literally viewing things through like pure essentialist identity, which I ident which ironically like does dehumanize women because you're literally just like, well, I mean, women are just like avatars of morality. Right. <laughs> they're, they're definitionally right. And then you get these like embarrassing, terrifying pieces like in the LA Times where that Virginia Heffernan oh my God. woman, which it's like this, it starts to look like, like, like this is like psychopathology. It's not politics. Well, the, the, the part of this that conflated Warren smearing Bernie a sexist with the whole like me too believe women like they I mean I'm just like what is wrong with you I don't know if you saw we played it on our show um Chris Cuomo did this handoff with Donald he's like well we know what happened because we have a woman who told us what happened <laughs> wow <laughs> it's like <laughs> I mean, to, how like to trivialize that, and that's how you end up just like destroying an entire worthwhile movement in the Me Too movement. And just for like the people who don't get the difference here, the reason why the inclination should be to believe women when they come forward about sexual assault 
is because there's no incentive to put that out there. It is almost always just completely destructive to the woman who puts that. Her reputation is dragged through the mud. I mean, it's traumatic. All of the, like, there's no reason to do it. You have no incentive to do it. Whereas with this, she has every incentive to do it. This is politics, and she's trying to win. Of course, of course she did it. Of course this came from her advisors. Who else would it come from? And so the fact that the incentives are all in favor of her lying or embellishing or shading the truth or whatever makes this completely different not to mention just i mean it's just insane to think that way but that's how that's how sort of like simple <laughs> some of the analysis of well this it's adolf reed been. it's essentialism and i mean yeah. I, it's just it's it's actually functionally profoundly destructive and antithetical Completely. to any attempt at progressive well, politics. And on the handshake specifically, I thought Nina Turner said it best. She she got asked about it. She's like, you just shake your colleague's hand. <laughs> but that piece in the LA right. Times, again, it tried to equate it like it was some weird bad boyfriend situation. Just give me a hug, baby. Can't we Come be on, friends? we're all good. Right. It's like, <laughs> yeah. what are Bernie. Well, he just wants to shake her hand. And like, if there is any abused spouse in this dynamic, I think we know who it is. Um, <laughs> somebody's gaslighting. Yeah, somebody's being gaslit oh to the ult, to the max. Yeah, but, that um, piece was insane. That piece was... Ap and, and now I want to just turn to this because this is like the new drama that just popped up um, with Bernie Sanders at the New York Times. And let's just play these clips back to back um, because... We'll start with Bernie, and then we'll go to President Obama. Um. What about the fact that Trump has touched a chord in 40 to 44 percent of the people? What about that issue? It's like Trump is a symptom of a widespread problem. Yes. So, I mean, how do you address that? What is the issue? How did Trump become president? Not everybody. But tens and tens of millions of Americans feel that the political establishment, Republican and Democrat, have failed them. Maybe the New York Times has failed them too. That, that explains the appeal of racism? Yeah. People are, in many cases in this country, working longer hours for low wages. You are aware of the fact that an unprecedented way life expectancy is actually going down in America because of diseases of despair. People have lost hope and they are drinking, they're doing drugs, they're committing suicide. And when that condition arises, whether it was the 1930s in Germany, then people are susceptible to the blame game, to say that it is the undocumented people in this country who are the cause of all of our problems. And if we just throw 10 million people out of the country, you're gonna have a good job, and you're gonna have good health care, and you have good education, that's all we gotta do. So all over the world, Trump didn't invent demagoguery. It's an age old weapon and you take a minority and you demonize that minority and you blame that minority and you take the despair and the anger and the frustration that people are feeling and you say, that's the cause of your problem. All right. So this was, I mean, this set off a whole chain reaction on Twitter. This was like, the, you know, everybody had the whole, like, everybody was basically responding to that with the Hillary Clinton, you know, bank regulation won't respond, race, won't solve racism thing. But I, I just want to play uh, President Obama back a couple of years ago. Uh, a suspicion of elites and uh, governing institutions that people feel may not be responsive to their immediate needs. Um, and that sometimes gets wrapped up in issues of ethnic identity or religious identity or cultural identity. Uh, and that can be a volatile mix. Uh, I think fear and anxiety in a lot of people, a sense that the economy wasn't as certain as it could be and maybe the game was rigged. Uh, President-elect Trump tapped into that particular strain within the Republican Party and then was able to broaden that enough uh, and get enough votes uh, to uh, win the election. The lesson I draw, and I, th I think people can draw a lot of lessons, but maybe one that cuts across countries is we have to deal with issues like inequality. We have to deal with issues of economic dislocation. We have to deal with uh, people's fears that their children won't do as well as they have. Uh, 
the more aggressively and effectively we deal with those issues, the less th those fears may channel themselves into counterproductive uh, approaches. <laughs> well, how dare first, he? Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> well, first of all, obviously Obama canceled. But uh, yeah. <laughs> your your first thoughts? I've got a bunch on this, so please go first. Well. Ever since 2016, there's been this, in my mind, very, very dumb debate of, over whether it was racism or economics that led to Trump, as if those things are just wholly unrelated. Right. And that's the thing is, you know, you have to, of course, like, obviously racism is a real thing, but part of why the Democratic establishment and people like the New York Times, et cetera, love to just say, oh, well, this happened because voters are racist or they're sexist, et cetera, and just put it all on the voters are bad people and they're like, there's like, you know, the deplorables, there's no hope for them, is because that keeps them from having to do, do any self-reflection about their own role in creating the conditions that led to Donald Trump. So if it's just the voters' fault, then I don't have to think about like the way that I championed these trade deals that destroyed parts of the, I don't have to think about how we had a massive, the worst addiction crisis in our nation's history on my watch. I don't have to think about the way that I bailed on the banks and didn't hold anyone accountable and left homeowners to just like lose everything basically. I don't have to think about the structure of neoliberalism that led to a small slice of people doing incredibly well and the rest of America basically screwed. Like I don't have to do any self analysis about that if it's just the voters are racist and bad. And so I think that's why there's such an attachment and such a like, and people get so triggered when you suggest, you know, these things go together. Like, just look at history. They go together. It's no accident that at times of massive inequality and massive, um, you know, where you do have this, this sort of core rot where the values we've been sold that buying the next piece of cheap Chinese made good is going to make us happy. Like that thing has all fallen apart. And at times when you have that kind of dislocation, yes, ugliness comes out, viciousness comes out, Deb demagogues come and seize on these ugly emotions. That's just a f historical fact. I, I have four quick things on this. I agree with you completely. But one, what drives me, cr okay. Number one is that this discourse is actually cheapening of the scale and the size of racism in American history too. Right. Because it's like if you want to just talk about the Republican Party, obviously white identity politics is a major part of the whole foundation of how this thing works. Yes. Ronald Reagan went to a town where civil rights workers were murdered to talk about states rights to launch a presidential campaign. Everybody knows what that means unless you're an idiot. Number and, and then the second part that's really important. I've seen these two guys on Twitter, and I'm sure I'll apologize later at some future date. But mm -hmm. as of now, there are these two brothers who love Elizabeth Warren, and they're much less fun than the Krasenstein brothers. <laughs> and one of them was doing this really genius point that you can't talk about economics with regards to dis discussing uh, racism because there are rich, racist white people. Now... <laughs> I want to make, like, this is just, I don't know. This is like the stuff, honestly, I'm going to just, I'll own my snobbery here. This stuff you take care of in a freshman year of like political theory or conversation. <laughs> like the conversation, the, no, then then it's like, how is it working in the different discourses? So there's a scapegoating discourse. Then there's a justification and hoarding discourse. And the interesting thing is that, some of this, and it's not as destructive, obviously, as the white supremacy you'll see in the Republican Party, but there is a parallel with neoliberal woke scold politics because the same functionality, like there's some new numbers that are really interesting that some of the highest numbers in group dislike of each other is internal to white people. There's like this big growth, in like white people hating each other because <laughs> white people are constantly having drama and making everything about themselves. Because, look, I'll, I'll, you can't run this as a campaign, but I'll say it in a podcast. White people are fucking annoying. <laughs> but <laughs> we all know this. But the thing was really interesting was that it, it, it what some of this research is pointing to is that 
important gains on understanding things like racism is not translating to a broader understanding of racism and class and inequality and all of these dynamics. It's turning into a certain group of upper middle class white people just creating another deserving poor for themselves. So instead of the racism of that these people would have in the 90s of demonizing poor African Americans, now they're just demonizing like they would like white trash they would say. Yeah. And so the point I'm making here is that the way that this discourse is starting to function for professional class democrats is functionally getting very similar because what it is it is functionally weaponized into is we're going to use it as a bludgeon against a redistribution candidate. Right. And in both cases the rhetoric works, and I'm just talking how the rhetoric works. I'm not making equivalency for people who get all triggered, but the rhetoric works in both cases to negate the forward motion of actual material redistribution. And that is why the the functionality of those discourses run in tandem. And the third thing to, that the uh, Krasens, the sad Krasenstein guy was saying, <laughs> I don't remember their names. And the third thing is that a couple, several years ago, this point that President Obama was making was totally non-controversial. Anybody could observe it. It's obvious. It There's endless empirical data, just as some people could absolutely point that there is racism that is dislocated you know, and has its own trajectory, no doubt. Right. But at the same time, if you go and you read any ethnographic study of why somebody becomes a neo-Nazi or gets drawn to a racist coalition or a terrorist for that matter, yep. there is always these types of issues. And by the way, the last thing I'll say, not just economic deprivation, it's also um, sense of lack of purpose, sense of lack of social meaning. What's really funny is I, I feel like sometimes now with some of these woke people, I'm it's like talking to a right wing person talking about Islamic terrorism because the point was never to justify Islamic terrorism or say it wasn't a threat or say it wasn't totally disgusting, but it was to say, you need to contextualize where these things are coming from. If it's just a metaphysical force, then there's nothing that can be done about it. And then, of course, as Adolf Reed says, well, right, then it does become a metaphysical force and we won't do anything about it. Right. You can perform on Twitter and then, oh, all of a sudden people still don't have health care. All of a sudden we're still not doing anything about housing. Well, to tie it back directly to the Elizabeth Warren flap, it's the type of politics that would say whether Bernie Sanders was woke enough in a private conversation with Elizabeth Warren over a year ago is more important than his record, than what he would do on the issues, than the substantive policy differences between all the candidates, like that it would privilege that conversation and whether he was perfectly PC, yep. like even in a private conversation one-on-one, -on -one, that that's more important than those substantive issues. Like that is the politics of the mainstream of the Democratic Party today. And it's no accident that as the party has been intentionally centered more, more around the professional managerial class, that that's the politics that you get. Because that allows you to say, like to signal your virtue and I'm a good person and I'm not racist and I'm, you know, I'm for the good fight and I'm for progress, et cetera, et cetera, without actually having any threat to your own material well-being, your own status in the hierarchy. So it's a very safe politics for, you know, the people who are in the New York Times editorial board or who are performatively woke on Twitter or who disproportionately make up the coalitions of Pete and Warren, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's also how you could say like Pete actually saying like, oh, the founding fathers didn't even know slavery was wrong. Like what's amazing is that what goes along with it, not to interrupt, is yeah. actually an incredible lack of realness about just how racist this country can be right. from like <laughs> right. actual historical perspective, not just like figuring out certain ways of signifying yourself on Twitter or in your campaign, because everything is offloaded to Trump or now Bernie, even more dementedly, you don't have to deal with anything. Right. It's just like, oh, well, you know, there was a time it was bad. Now there's Trump. Right. Right. I use the right all... terminology, right? right? Okay, great. Right. I don't have to raise my taxes. Awesome. I don't have to raise my taxes. I don't have to think about my complicity in creating this situation. And there's another piece of this too, though, which is that in in the modern era, in the in the past, you know, past 30 years, let's say, basically the Democrats and Republicans, they've both bought into this idea of the 
the goal of the perfect meritocracy, right. right? That if we can just have a system that functions where the brilliant little Barack Obamas can ascend to their rightful place in the meritocracy, then all will be well. And functionally, the only difference between the two parties was that Republicans were like, the meritocracy is already perfect, so no worries. There's no racism anymore. There's no sexism anymore. We're all good to go. And the Democrats were like, no, the meritocracy would be perfect, but we just need to deal with racism, sexism, like as these sort of isolated items that we need to excise from the hearts of Americans. And so if you look at, a, at poor white people, poor white men in particular, and you're a Democrat and you buy into this nonsense about the meritocracy and how the only barriers are like race, gender, religion, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the list of uh, appropriate excuses for why people are doing well, right? And you look at this group that's not doing well and you've got no reason. You're like, you can't, you don't have any, a systemic critique that says, oh, well, this whole thing is rotten to its core. Right. And so, of course, people suffer across race, gender, religious lines and this group of you know of of white men and women are part of the the groups that are suffering under this rotten system so instead you have to say well there you you have to look at them with contempt i mean there's nothing else and you you can say yeah you lula know, didn't say like people of italian descent in the favela are privileged right exactly <laughs> like you can't and that's that that is what we heard a lot in the run-up to trump is like Oh, well, these white working class people, you know, they have white privilege. So in, in our hierarchy, they don't they don't rank and they must be flawed on some fundamental level as human beings, because this whole system supposedly in this framework is set up for them to succeed. And they're not succeeding. So it's on them. And that is a purely reactionary narrative. Like, that's what I really want to underscore. Like, that's the whole point of Adolf Reed. That's what like when we talked on, on the show a couple months ago, I was like, look, you wrote about this stuff, you know, you read like the New Republic in the 90s. It's all, ironically, the same people that would be supporting Warren and Pete today writing these disgusting racist narratives about there's poverty in the inner city because of rap music. I mean, literally, like just, just this kind of garbage versus like racism and economic theft and deindustrialization. And now you get the woke version of like, and it's, again, it's not to say that like, look, people, there's there's problems, there's flaws, things are complex, blah blah blah. But if you go to some bombed out, deindustrialized place in like West Virginia, and you show up and you're just like, these people have toxic masculinity, <laughs> and if that is the guiding part of your analysis, you're a fucking idiot, and you and you are like dilute, like you're reactionary. You're making you're you're making a moralistic argument about people who have been materially devastated. And that it, look, and that's the engine of my politics. And I, and I, apparently that bothers some people. But that's how I look at things. Yeah. That was why I was always appalled and disgusted by those same narratives about race, frankly. And I'm not gonna, you know, I don't have like a loophole when it comes to other areas of the economy. Of course, relatively, like, would you pick being a working class poor white man versus a working class poor Mexican woman? Obviously, there is, of course, relative privilege disparities there. Of course. But on the broader section of like the economy and how it functions, I mean, no, I'm not talking, I'm not making moral narratives about groups. I'm talking about how the fucking economy works. That was one of the things that really sort of broke my relationship with the Democratic Party is um, when I was living in Kentucky and, you know, I've done lots of work in West Virginia as well. And I would, you know, tweet out something about something important that was going on there, you know, an election that was lost, that was significant, that was going to impact people's lives or, you know, some uh, a health outcome that was just anything that was going on there. And what I would get back is like, oh, well, screw those people. Who cares? It's like I did not sign up to belong to a party that would pick and choose who was worthy of their empathy and who wasn't like who we want to help and who we exclude because we've cast some moral judgment upon them. I mean, think about the insanity of this, right? We are rightfully so the party that talks about 
criminal justice reform and giving people a second chance. Like people have committed horrific crimes and we still believe like these are human beings and they deserve to vote, they deserve to be members of society, et cetera, et cetera. To fully have a life. To fully have a life. Absolutely. And yet on the other hand, you're gonna look at someone who's struggling in West Virginia who, you know, doesn't know all the right woke or PC language or genuinely holds views that are unacceptable and abhorrent and toxic masculinity and all of that. Like I'm not saying that's okay, but you're willing to forgive the incarcer formerly incarcerated person, you're not willing to forgive that person or give them a second chance. I just, that doesn't make any kind of sense to me whatsoever. Plus, wh what does that lead to? Like, how does it even make coherent sense as a party to say, we wanna help this group, we don't wanna help that group. We're gonna look at this working class and break it into you know, demographics and go after certain ones of them. That's how you end up with the kind of shallow identity politics that just focuses on like microaggressions as the end all be all of what you wanna do for people. Right. It is the exact, it is ex almost exactly the flip of what the Republicans do. I mean, Republicans pander on culture on white identity culture, and it's been very successful. And that has kept them from being a, to, from having to respond to the actual economic interests and needs of their coalition by signaling on white identity culture. Democrats basically do the same thing. Rather than actually responding to the material interests of their multiracial working class, like black and brown working class coalition, instead, they're basically like, well, we're not racist. So you have to be with and us. And as we always say, it's like, <laughs> look, it's like if the two options are white supremacy capitalism versus like diversity capitalism, we will pick diversity, diversity capitalism. But I think we'd like to actually aim a little bit higher. Right. We'd actually like to provide some like broad human decency. And I think, I mean, you're a hundred percent right. And the other thing too, that also strikes me is like, if you're just doing that brokerage model of politics, you are going to have an innate limit on how broadly you can build that coalition. Of course. And it's also going to get opportunistically flipped, right? Like, that's another thing about, I have no problem saying that Trump absolutely, of course, a major part of what he did was racism, xenophobia. Anybody who would deny that is denying reality. But he also upped his margins, relatively speaking, with Hispanic voters and with African American voters. And that is all purely jobs and corruption rhetoric. Right. So you have to take it all on. And I just, yeah, I think that. My this game with Bernie just really distills everything. My aspirations for this nation are greater than changing the gender ratio of our oppressors. Like that's I have I dream bigger I than think that. You dream right? Slightly bigger than <laughs> like, that. Okay, those are my only yeah. options, like you said. Yes, I'd like to have more women and more people of yeah. color in the, you know, oppression class. But I would it was rather... a it was a bisexual woman that actually wrote the Supreme Court decision that reformalized indentured servitude for student loans. Slay queen. Yeah, yeah slay queen. <laughs> if the Republicans run a woman in 2024, I guess we just shouldn't even run a candidate. Yeah, let's get Sarah Palin back, <laughs> yeah. right? Well, I mean, when you think about the incredible microaggression of Barack Obama and Joe Biden running against her, it really makes you rethink a lot of so stuff. Wrong. It's disgusting. How could they? How could they do Who was that? Who put out that tweet that was like, well, one way Bernie could prove he's not sexist by not running against a woman. It's like uh, Matthew Dowd, who literally was a propaganda architect of the invasion of Iraq. Oh I mean, I love God. that's what I love about it. It's like you can't even just at least those sad Krasenstein brothers are like just you know, some goofy guys that like Elizabeth Warren. But now it's like we have people who have actually, like, I'm Mr. Forgive, Rehabilitate, People Are Complicated. Yeah. But you have people coming out of the woodwork who have done maybe some of the only things that were just like, you know what, you help propagandize an effort that murdered like over a million people. You probably should be like, you should be a Nick Nolte character, growing a beard, feeling guilty somewhere in the country. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> you should not be on ABC News right. opining about anything. Or how about all the people who've been hired at MSNBC, uh, you know, national security state apparatchiks who are now like Trump resistance warriors and heroes? I mean, this is where. And that's where, like, the danger of that type of politics and the subsuming of those. MSNBC, my former employer, 
they literally found their identity in opposition to the Iraq war, right? right? That was the galvanizing thing. And look, this is a capitalistic enterprise. They saw Keith Olbermann's show was doing that and it worked. And so they just like, you know, kept going from there. And now it's come full circle with the very people they were opposing are like now celebrated and on the payroll, et cetera, et cetera. But that, again, leads you to a politics. These are Republicans. Like, they're not your allies, but it leads you to a politics that focuses on this, like, civility and word policing. And, you know, the worst we can say about Donald Trump is that he's broken the norms and guardrails. Which that- is, like, the only good thing you could say about him. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like that awesome, like, I just got impeached for making the perfect phone call. Right. <laughs> But that's but and that's if politics also, was all just that stuff, I would be a Republican. But that's he's funny. That's also like I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's also just like kidding. you yeah. know that's the that's the core of these people's politics, and it's their key to their paycheck too. Right, right. It's the key to them maintaining their status in the power structure. That's why so many of these like you know never Trump Republicans are so mad is <laughs> because they don't have power and purchase. And the gig flow that they used to have in the town. That's the real thing. Absolutely. Let's um, don't have here's, principles. It's not about that. Of course not. Can you can we take a little break? You'll spend a little bit of time with us in the post game. All right. Happy to. Because we're going to talk about Pete Buttigieg. Speaking of not elevating our mood. And then we have to. Joy Reid. This is. Dude, I remember I, when this show started, I was the one saying to people. I was with Bree Joy Gray saying like, you know what? Leave Joy, leave Joy Reid alone. Who cares? I was wrong. Mia culpa. No, because that's honestly that's my attitude. I don't I don't have an either or attitude about people. But I just find like one a lot of the people in this certain part that we're talking about do not extend that back. <laughs> and two, it's like well, I mean, as I say, if Vladimir Putin was savvy enough to know that Joy Reid was going to get a bump on MSNBC, and be like, all right, now it's time to write those fucking homophobic posts back in 2008. I think uh, <laughs> then he should run. And I'm sorry, I know this will upset Sagar. Vladimir Putin should run the international system. If he has that type of strategic <laughs> and foresight. The, and a time machine to back yeah, it up. Yeah, he's just like, all right, we, it's time to use the time machine. I think Joy Reid's going to get the Melissa Harris Perry spot on that weekend. So <clears throat> let's write some homophobic blog spots, 2008. David and I were talking about maybe we should uh, read the body language on her saying that Russians had hacked into her blog. <laughs> that's, exactly what, that's exactly what we should do. That's what we're going to do in the post game. All right. So, folks, we're going to take a break. As always, become a patron. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Get your tickets to the show. There's going to be a lot of news about my book coming up in the next couple of weeks. Yay. Crystal, what are all the ways? Talk about this. When am I going to get to read? I'm. I can't believe I didn't get asked to write a blurb for this book. I mean, that's that's really the top takeaway headline for a narcissist. I didn't want to trouble you. I'd already asked you to be part of the show, so oh, I feel like I feel like I had already put all my ass out there. Good um, recovery. Okay, rising.substack.com. Yes. That's where you go to find out about the book, Populist Guide to 2020. Uh, new right and new left are rising, written with me and my co-host Sagar. And we're coming to LA in February, and then we're coming to New York with Michael in March and Kyle Kolinsky as well. So those are the things. Those are the things I know right now. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate all of you. Obviously, it was a great week this week. That was a big accomplishment. And I think it's shared with everybody. And the appreciation there is is, is real. We'll see you guys in the postgame.